So the previous theorem stated that uh, compact self-adjoint operators from an Hilbert space X into a Hilbert space X, which are not zero, have at least one non-vanishing eigenvalue. And uh, so that's amount to saying that uh, there is a pair of eigenvector and eigenvalue u1 and lambda1 with the property that uh, the um, absolute value of lambda1 is the norm of k and uh, the, uh, the norm of u1 we choose to be 1. Okay, now uh, define the operator k1. Apply to u as um, KU minus lambda one times the scalar product of U and U one times U one. First of all, uh, K one U one. Uh, let's let me first state that uh, of course K one is self adjoint and compact self-adjoint that's clear and compact due to the fact that K is compact and uh, um, the range of the second operator that gets subtracted is finite dimensional. So we have the, uh, the sum or the difference of two finite dimensional, of course, two compact operators, which is again compact. Okay, um, so um, now we have two chance. So let me, let, me let, me, let me tell you first what K1, U1 is. K1 U1 is K U1, which is lambda 1 U1 minus lambda 1 scalar product U1 on U1 times U1. And since we assumed that the norm of U1 was 1, this is exactly the same, it is exactly 0. So that means U1 is uh, in the kernel of K1. Now, since uh, K1 um, is self-adjoint and compact, if K1 is not the zero operator, so if norm of K1 is not equal to zero, then we have a pair of eigenvector and eigen, uh, eigen, um, eigenvector, eigenvalue with the property that k u2 is lambda 2 times u2. And uh, now uh, we have the absolute value of lambda 2, excuse me, k1 u2 is lambda, time, uh, lambda 2 times u2. And uh, the absolute value of lambda 2 is, um, absolute value of lambda 2 is the norm of k1 which is not equal to zero. And again, we choose the norm of U2 to be one. Okay, now U1 and U2 are eigen, uh, eigen uh, vectors of K1 for different eigenvalues. Uh, U1 for zero, the other one for lambda two not equal to zero. So definitely we first have that U1 and U2 are orthogonal to each other. Now, since they're orthogonal, we have that uh, lambda 2 U2 is the same as K1 applied to U2. Uh, now that's uh, K u2 minus lambda 1 times the scalar product of u1 and u2 times u1, but this is 0. So this is k times u2. And we find that u2 is um, an eigenvector. of k with respect to lambda 2. 
Now, since lambda one was the largest by absolute value, the largest eigenvalue of k, we already have that lambda one is smaller or equal, larger or equal to lambda two. Now, uh, it's quite obvious what we'll now be doing. So I define an operator k, um, kn as kn u, as ku minus some from, um, yeah, <laughs> need to do this right now, minus the sum of um, k equals one, um, is it to n or to n minus one? No, it's, it's to n. Lambda k times u, uh, u uh, scalar product of u and uk times uk. And uh, now you can do everything with kn, right? I mean, if kn is not the null operator, then kn has uh, an uh, eigenvalue lambda n plus one, uh, which is not zero. Uh, its absolute value is uh, the norm of kn. Um, and uh, the, per the uh, foreign eigenvector un plus one, and again we reply, we require that the norm of un plus one should be one, and uh, well, you can do that ad infinitum, and uh, what you get is a sequence of eigenvalues, and of course that one is again now um, a, um, an eigenvector of kn, but it's also an eigenvector of k in exactly the same fashion. So what we're finally left with is a sequence, a system of eigenvectors UK, which are orthonormal, and eigenvalues lambda K, which do not vanish with eigenvalues, lambda k, with the property that uh, all lambda k's are not equal to zero, and uh, uh, with the additional property that they are uh, ordered by their magnitude, absolute magnitude, so lambda one is rather than lambda two, and so on. Okay, so, uh, the question is, um, by that procedure, are we getting all the eigenvalues or are we, will we be missing some? Well, um, let's look at what might happen. Now the question is, uh, do we get all of these? And first of all, we must consider one special case, which I just forgot. And uh, I, uh, I always assumed that Kn is not equal to zero. If kn is equal to zero, then we see that k, and, uh, k has uh, an extremely simple structure because if this over here, oops, <laughs> if this over here is zero, then ku can be written as the sum of k from one to n lambda k v times vk, v times uk times uk. And uh, for this simple structure, everything which I'm going to prove is going to be very simple. And so um, if k and u is zero, then it just, uh, then the, the sequence 
of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors we have is just finite. So later when I'll be talking about infinite series, just think of finite series at that point and then everything's going to be okay. Um, now, so that handles the, uh, the case that Kn equals zero. If that's the case, then everything gets much, much simpler. Now, um, let us assume now, one thing is clear. If we have some um, eigenvalue, oops, I'll never learn this. If uh, we have an eigenvalue lambda one, uh, then, mm. or lambda, lambda 2, lambda n. Then if there is any eigenvalue which is larger than lambda n, it must have already been included in the series of lambda 1 to lambda n minus 1 because we are really counting the eigenvalues down beginning at the largest one and going down to to the smaller ones. So it's clear that um, if I have some lambda n, all eigenvalues that are larger than lambda n have already been counted, have already been accounted for. So um, that, um, in, this set, in this sense, that set is complete. Now, what could happen? It could happen that uh, lambda n gets stuck at some point, so that uh, we the all the lambda k are larger than some value, and there are some eigenvalues below which we will never reach. Okay, what would that mean? It would mean that uh, if uh, lambda n, And now I'm thinking about the uh, case of infinitely many eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If uh, lambda n is bounded from below, well, it's a, um, it's a monotonic decreasing function. And if it's bounded from below, that means that lambda n, absolute value of lambda n converges and it converges, let's say, to some c and uh, that c should not be zero, right? Uh, um, with a limit that's larger than zero. Now, um, if that is the case, then uh, let's look at the corresponding eigenfunctions, eigenvectors, un. And uh, let's look at 1 over lambda n times un. Okay, 1 over lambda n uh, un is, um, is um, 1 over lambda n un is bounded since uh, the absolute value of uh, um, of lambda uh, the absolute value of the lambda n converges to c we have that uh, this is bounded and the absolute value of the, uh, is 1 over lambda n absolute value times the norm of un, and the norm of un is 1. So uh, uh, that converges to uh, 1 over c. So definitely that is bounded by whatever constant c. OK, um, now let's take the uh, compact operator k. And let's apply that to the bounded sequence 1 over lambda n u n. And then that's k times u n. Um, that's lambda u n over lambda u n. So this is u n. And uh, since k is compact, u n must have convergent subseries. But in the exercises you already showed, my, the UN are an autom orthonormal system 
which means that the difference of UK minus UL is um, greater or equal to one over the square root of two uh, for K not equal to L. So definitely UN has no convergent subseries. And that means uh, that's a contradiction. And uh, that means that my assumption was wrong. One over lambda n, uh, the, the uh, lambda n cannot be bounded from below by any number that's larger than zero. So if there are infinitely many um, um, eigenvalues, then we find that lambda n converges to zero. Okay, and I will now sum this result up in the beginning of the next video.